Hello to all my queers and dears. Happy New Year, and welcome to the January 2024 monthly video essay. I hope you enjoyed that amazing new intro by my friend Zell Ryder with music composed by yours truly. Most of my creative works I upload that use it will have a shorter version, but if you see any of my work that has the longer version, know that it's work I'm especially proud of. The essay you are about to watch included. This month, we're going to be digging into one of the biggest political issues of our time. Freedom of speech. What is it? And what should it be? What rights and limits do we actually have? And what rights and limits should we have to manage the harm that speech can cause? What's the difference between the law and what we believe is right? What are the realities of the dangers we face? And what does that mean for our culture and our responsibilities? That's not even everything. So many complicated questions and so much debate around all of them, seemingly with very little understanding or at least highly divisive conclusions. I'm hoping this video will be useful for anyone with any political affiliation, so whether you're left, right, or center, I hope you'll give this video a shot and approach it in good faith. I really hope to help break down some of the nuances of modern speech issues, explain some more issues that don't get as much attention, and address some misconceptions as well as hopefully provide some steps in the right direction going forward. And as always, I will be citing my sources and linking them in the description. I always try to cover my bases and create well-researched and accurate videos for you all, but topics this sensitive in particular require a thorough, well-researched academic approach that I am hoping I have been able to achieve. Because of the depth of this topic, in order to release an essay this month, and not torture my poor editor more than I already have, I had to split this into two parts. The first part will be focused on clarifying the issues we are dealing with, including breaking down the First Amendment, the way its implementation has failed, and the dangers those failures have introduced, while part two will focus on where these issues come from, what specifically needs to be addressed, and some suggestions for how to address them. If you find yourself liking the video and have the financial means to support my work, please consider joining my Patreon. I've got some really cool stuff I'm planning, and I want to be able to pay everyone involved fairly, so any help would be so appreciated. More details at the end of the video. Before we begin, it's important to be upfront that I am not a lawyer. I am not going to be able to explain all the ins and outs of free speech law and how it's evolved over the 200 plus years since the ratification of the Bill of Rights. My hope is simply to try and clear up some misconceptions and offer some new ways of framing the discussion. It's also really important to give some content warnings for this video because we will be covering some very difficult topics. This video includes discussions of suicide, trauma, threats to inflict bodily harm, school and mass shootings, terrorism, doxing, stalking, racism, transphobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and other forms of bigotry and hate. Without further ado, let's dig in. Adam Myers and Adam Splitters Entertainment present The Inevitable Limits of Speech, Part 1. Edited by Remnant Bardock and Adam Myers. What free speech actually is, is a surprisingly complicated and misunderstood issue. There are many modern debates over what speech is, or ought to be, protected by the US Constitution, and by extension, what isn't, and what ought not to be. Of course, this is also an extremely American-centric way of looking at the issue, but I am American, and the First Amendment often seems cited when dealing with these issues not least because most major social media platforms are American-based, and other countries often have something at the very least similar, so I believe focusing on free speech as it pertains to the United States is still very useful. And also, this video is long enough as is. <laughs> to understand the modern free speech debate, we have to go to the roots of the First Amendment and examine its purpose, as well as the limits and permissions that have been interpreted under it throughout America's history. We then need to analyze how that may have been interpreted by the public in a way that has led to modern fears about censorship, the control of speech, and the violation of the First Amendment. 
as well as whether any of those fears are rooted in real issues. There are, I believe, two separate debates around free speech that don't tend to get reconciled with one another. The first is what speech is actually literally legally protected under the First Amendment and what isn't. And the second is what we might call the spirit of free speech. That is, regardless of the legality, is speech allowed to accomplish what the First Amendment is supposed to provide protection for? That second one is more complicated than a lot of people tend to think due to some of the ways that the First Amendment has been implemented and interpreted over the years. Once we understand all these issues, we can talk about the biggest threat modern approaches to freedom of expression pose. And then, in part two, we will talk about how something I call monetary politics makes it so hard to address that threat. It's impossible to know exactly what was going on in the minds of the writers of the Bill of Rights hundreds of years ago when they crafted it, but we do know that the Bill of Rights was created to protect citizens from the federal government due to worries about potentially repeating the issues created by the British monarchy. What that means is that the First Amendment only exists to protect citizens from government overreach. The First Amendment is worded as such. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Note that not only is the First Amendment explicitly about limits imposed on the government, the First Amendment concerns the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, the freedom of assembly, the freedom to petition your government, and the freedom of speech. Most Americans don't know the specific wording of the First Amendment off the top of their head, if at all, so its emphasis on Congress often goes unacknowledged, despite being incredibly important, as wording in law always is. The First Amendment does not protect anyone from social backlash, nor does it protect from school or career consequences. There are laws against discrimination on the basis of national origin, race, color, religion, disability, sex, and familial status, but those laws are not part of the First Amendment. Being fired from one's job for expressing beliefs that damage the company image, that go against the company mission, or that create a space that is harmful to one's co-workers is neither a violation of free speech, nor is it inherently discriminatory. Organizations like the ACLU have often been criticized for defending the speech of neo-Nazis, KKK members, and the like, their defense is that by defending the speech of those kinds of people, they are defending all speech. Which isn't necessarily untrue, but also isn't completely true. Because, contrary to common sentiments, freedom of speech has almost never in American history been absolute. Though because of the importance placed on the First Amendment, not just by the public, but also by the law and the courts, what speech is punishable has become narrower and narrower over the years. The Bill of Rights, obviously including the First Amendment, was ratified in 1791, though contrary to popular belief, it was only reluctantly ratified, purely done so to appease the states that were not confident that the Constitution as written would do enough to prevent government overreach. Even then, it had been whittled down from 20 amendments to 10. The actual writers of the Constitution were not the staunch believers in free speech that some make them out to be. And in fact, the First Amendment being the First Amendment is a complete coincidence and not a indicator of its importance. Relevant to that, seven years later, in 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed, the latter of which were explicit restrictions on free speech. As detailed by the National Archives, In 1978, the United States stood on the brink of war with France. As a result, a Federalist-controlled Congress passed four laws, known collectively as the Alien and Sedition Acts. These laws raised the residency requirements for citizenship, authorized the president to deport aliens, and permitted their arrest, imprisonment, and deportation during wartime. The Sedition Act made it a crime for American citizens to print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing about the government. Sedition Act trials, along with the Senate's use of its contempt powers to suppress dissent, set off a firestorm of criticism against the Federalists and contributed to their defeat in the election of 1800, after which the acts were repealed or allowed to expire. 
It only took seven short years for the ratification of the right to freedom of speech for it to receive its first limits in American law. They were harmful restrictions and undone relatively quickly, but even so it makes it blatantly clear that consequences to speech that is considered harmful or a high risk is not some new phenomenon, and that's before we even start talking about social consequences rather than legal consequences. As American law has changed, other restrictions have been introduced. These few narrow categories of speech that are not protected from government restrictions include incitement, defamation, fraud, obscenity, child pornography, intellectual property violations, fighting words, and true threats. Some of you may be surprised to learn that there are not, nor have there ever been, laws against hate speech in America. Nor does the rhetoric often accused of being hate speech necessarily fall under the categories above that you may think, such as fighting words, true threats, or defamation. The law is basically a completely different language from regular English, so the definition of something like true threats or fighting words does not mean the same legally as it does colloquially. Despite there being a definition set by the European Union, there is no agreed upon definition of hate speech in America, in part due to concerns about evolving language. A term that might count as hate speech today might not in a few years, or vice versa. It also might register as hate speech to some, and not others. Dog whistles are even harder to manage legally, since they are by their nature obfuscating the real meaning behind them. The First Amendment also protects hyperbolic language, which many instances of what might be considered hate speech could easily be argued to be. For some issues, such as harmful speech that are very complex, American courts develop tests that are used going forward to weigh whether something violates a law. In this context, we are looking at the limits that can be placed on speech by the government as legal terms. That means that what the common person believes should fall under these categories, and what these categories actually include legally, are not always the same thing. And as mentioned, this disparity between the colloquial and legal definitions of the same term is often where a lot of the discourse gets very messy, particularly as it pertains to those tests due to them getting narrower over time. During World War I, in developments not so different from the ones Americans have been going through since 2016, and then in particular since 2020, the American people began to question and challenge a lot of the political and societal structures they felt were causing injustice in the United States. There were political movements that promoted socialism, communism, feminism, racial justice, and movements that objected to military drafts and war in its entirety. Often, there was overlap between these movements as well. This is when the Espionage Act of 1917 was passed, which prohibited obtaining and disseminating information or documents related to national defense that could be used against the United States and made it criminal for anyone to obstruct enlistment in the military. After the creation of this new limit on free speech came a case known as Schenck v. the United States. The socialists Charles Schenck and Dr. Elizabeth Baer had been distributing information that objected to the draft, and because America was at war, at that moment, this became considered dangerous speech. In Shank v. the United States, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes created what is known as the Clear and Present Danger Test. The argument behind this test is that critical and provocative speech is protected, but speech that advocates for something that could likely lead to immediate danger is not. Objecting to the draft outside of wartime would likely have been permitted, but during war, it was considered too high a risk. This case is where the famous metaphor of falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater comes from, though it wasn't exactly a metaphor at the time, as there were actual stampedes that killed people. The clear and prison danger test was most impactfully used in a case in 1927 against a woman named Anita Whitney, a feminist, suffragist, and pacifist, advocating for racial equality and part of the Communist Labor Party, which had long-lasting ramifications on free speech law. As lawyer and law professor with expertise in the First Amendment Marianne Franks and NPR host Ram Teen Arubile discuss on an episode of NPR's podcast Throughline, in 1927, when the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of Anita Whitney for helping to organize the Communist Labor Party, it set a precedent that would remain in place for decades. States could punish people who use speech that tends to incite crime, disturb the public peace, or threaten to overthrow the government by unlawful means. 
Clarence Brandenburg is a KKK leader who calls up a reporter and says, you should film everything that happens at this rally. And at this rally, he's in full clan regalia speaking to all of these other hooded um, individuals and says, if the white race uh, continues to be oppressed by the president and Congress and the Supreme Court, we may have to take, and he calls it, revengeance. They're carrying weapons. They're using anti-Black, anti-Semitic mm. slurs. It's pretty clear that it's meant to be threatening and intimidating. And the the, the broadcast of, of the speech is, is not just played on local news, but it makes national news, so everybody really has the chance to hear it. He's convicted for the speech under the Ohio mm. statute, and it goes up to the Supreme Court, and you get the opposite result. So what they give you in the Brandenburg case is a different test. Now we have a test of imminent lawless action. You can't prohibit people's speech unless the speaker intended really to incite imminent lawless action. That is, pretty much has to happen immediately, and it has to be really likely that that lawlessness is going to happen. So it's a really, really narrow view of what you're allowed to prohibit under the, the First Amendment. While this new test has absolutely allowed abhorrent speech to gain tremendous ground in public discourse, such as that of the KKK, it must be understood that this test has also protected many leftists who have been openly stating preferences for communism or socialism, as well as anyone who has expressed a belief that political violence, either as self-defense against the rising fascist movement or as a tool for addressing embedded societal inequities, may be necessary. All this to say, cracking down on speech is extremely risky. There are many ways that cracking down can be misused, and a lot of those are unknown to the average American and or hard for them to understand. As Marianne Franks discusses in her book The Cult of the Constitution, however, this borderline religious protection of free speech has been weaponized just as much as any limits the government has been given permission to impose. While they've always been around, the influence of so-called free speech absolutists has certainly seemed to grow in recent years, And as such, whether the protections of free speech should be absolute or not is often at the center of the issues we're discussing, despite the fact that even the most principled free speech absolutist would likely have limits they wish to impose on speech such as the creation of child pornography. Though, you might be surprised to know that revenge porn, also known as non-consensual pornography, that is, the sharing of explicit nudity or sexual content of another human being without their consent, has long been defended by self-proclaimed civil rights groups like the ACLU. It's important to understand where the almost religious protection of the First Amendment comes from, which is that the protection of freedom of speech is considered by many to be the protection on which a strong democracy is built for a few different reasons. For example, in principle, it allows for the exchange of ideas that allow the citizens to determine what they believe to be the best direction for the country, and thus determine how to vote. And again, in principle, it allows for the citizens to determine truth through that exchange of ideas, rather than to have the truth determined by partisan forces in the government. Basically, the freedom of expression is the most fundamental right on which all other rights are based. If you can be punished for your freedom of expression, suddenly a lot of things fall apart. The theory that free speech absolutists acting in good faith tend to subscribe to is known as the marketplace of ideas. This theory posits that if all, or at least almost all, speech is allowed, so-called bad speech will be countered with so-called better speech, and the public will be able to determine through what speech wins out which speech is truthful and helpful to society. As the name suggests, it operates on similar faith to the theory of competition that drives unregulated capitalism in that, if you let all the companies compete without regulation, the consumers will determine the best companies and products, and which company makes the best products will come out on top. As has become clear to the majority of the public, unregulated capitalism has only allowed the most powerful, wealthy, and or malicious people and corporations to dominate, shrink, crush, and or manipulate the markets they operate in, making the most wealthy shareholders more wealthy, while the public receives products that are worse and worse, yet also more and more expensive. The marketplace of ideas as a theory fails in the same way, with the most powerful, wealthy, and or malicious people and corporations developing strategies to dominate, control, suppress, and or manipulate the narrative to their liking through gaming the system via human bias, emotional manipulation, power disparity, and the self-interest of other powerful individuals and corporations. Due to the disregard of all these issues, in practice free speech absolutism is impossible to implement without becoming a hypocrite. 
To protect all speech equally means protecting the speech of those using their speech to silence others. Neutral enforcement of law is impossible in a systemically biased society. Which is why, to give more attention to the groups that have been historically prevented from accessing the majority of their constitutional rights via diversity and inclusion efforts, is not giving those groups extra rights, protections, or privileges, simply addressing what was preventing them from accessing what they were already supposed to have access to. An uncomfortably recent example, as in July 2023, less than a year ago at time of writing, of the failure of implementing law without understanding everything I just detailed, was the Supreme Court's decision on the case Counterman v. Colorado. The case concerned a multi-year campaign from Billy Counterman to non-consensually insert himself into singer-songwriter Cole Zwalen's life through thousands of messages on social media, including circumventing her blocking of his accounts through finding her on other platforms and making new accounts. Beyond unwanted advances, these messages included, but were not limited to, statements that indicated Counterman was actively watching the defendant offline. While Colorado defined stalking in part as communication that would cause a reasonable person to suffer serious emotional distress, Counterman managed to get his appeal using the First Amendment as a defense up to the Supreme Court, which determined in July 2023 that his speech was constitutionally protected because Counterman did not act recklessly, defined as the accused being aware that others could regard his statements as threatening violence and delivers them anyway. There were messages where Mr. Counterman would reference details about where she had been or the vehicle she was driving, who she was hanging out with. Some sounding familiar. I'm going to the store. Would you like anything? Others unsettling. I'm currently unsupervised. I know it freaks me out too, but the possibilities are endless. And the alarming. You're not being good for human relations. Die. Don't need you. In no uncertain terms, this decision declared stalking as not only legal, but protected under the amendment considered by many to be the most sacred of constitutional rights. This ruling was praised by some who claimed to value free speech, including some figures at the ACLU. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? This is, without any doubt, complete hypocrisy. There is no principled defense of free speech taking place when speech and actions that unequivocally and undeniably silence victims through causing extreme distress and even creating implications of immediate danger are declared constitutionally protected. This was, at absolute best, extremely biased and preferential. Even as it's true that tests like Brandenburg have protected many leftists as much as any far-right extremists, the ACLU's history of defending neo-Nazis and KKK members is not so far removed from this either, considering the sole missions of those organizations will inevitably include the suppression of speech from the marginalized groups they target. While it is argued, not without basis, that we must tolerate the existence of speech we find abhorrent in order to prevent weaponized censorship against and criticism of how things are currently run, we cannot ignore that this defense allows for laws that are not simply tolerating abhorrent speech, but actively ignoring the purpose of that speech as an intimidation and silencing tool. Speech that itself is chilling of other speech cannot be countered with so-called better speech. And as such, it is impossible to defend the speech of people who silence others with their speech and maintain a sincere and principled mission to protect all speech. Because of this practically sacred treatment of the First Amendment without consideration for the systemic biases and injustices that prevent it from being equally protected for the most marginalized people in society, a unique threat has become more and more prevalent in recent years. This threat is known as stochastic terrorism. In order to understand what speech needs to be stopped in this modern era, we need to understand an issue called stochastic terrorism. The term stochastic means for something to be randomly determined, having a high likelihood to happen at some point, but cannot be actually reliably predicted when or how in any meaningful way. Stochastic terrorism, then, is when so-called lone wolf terrorists, terrorists that are not directly associated with any particular group nor have been directly instructed by any particular figure, become a likely outcome of a certain rhetoric, conspiracy, or culture of fear, but cannot have their actions directly linked to the person or group creating or spreading that rhetoric, conspiracy, or culture of fear, 
due to the random and unpredictable pattern of who will take that rhetoric, conspiracy, and culture of fear and actually turn it into real physical violence against other humans. Two good examples of this are Alex Jones and Chai Rychek of Infowars and Libs of TikTok fame, respectively. Alex Jones is a right-wing commentator who markets himself as speaking the truths the mainstream media don't want the public to hear, while selling solutions to the problems he reports on. Donald Trump himself is a big fan of Infowars, their shared passion for baseless conspiracies and getting donations from the people who believe them, resulting in a natural collaborative relationship, if not explicitly, certainly in a more nebulous fashion. This led to Jones attending rallies on January 5th and 6th after months of rhetoric urging Trump supporters to prepare to fight against the results of any election that didn't result in their favor, making him a particularly desired person of interest for the January 6th Insurrection Investigation Committee. Jones also made sure to invite Ye West as a valued guest on his show during the news cycle where West had been denying the Holocaust, expressing support of Hitler, and generally showing himself to be a proud anti-Semite. However, potentially one of Jones' most long-term damaging contributions to public discourse has been his repeated claim that the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre in 2012 never happened, and that all the survivors and family members that have spoken about it are crisis actors that are used to lend credibility to the tragedy he claims is a coordinated hoax to drum up support for gun control laws. Jones was embroiled in multiple defamation lawsuits from family members of children who were killed at Sandy Hook because of these claims and lost both the case in Connecticut and the case in Texas, now owing collectively over a billion dollars to those families which he is refusing to pay. The reason why this is relevant to stochastic terrorism is because of what these families have gone through since Jones began to spread these claims. Lenny Posner, being one of the more public names of a victim family member due to speaking to reporters the day after the massacre, and having spent much time and energy taking down Sandy Hook conspiracies through copyright claims over the images of him and his child the conspiracists were using, has been stalked, doxxed, and even harassed on the street 3,000 miles away from where his daughter was killed. Posner and other parents of the children murdered have had their locations actively exposed online by conspiracists after moving to a new home to escape the harassment and danger of being the target of a conspiracy. It's not clear if Alex Jones was the original source of the crisis actor gun control conspiracy, but he used his platform to push it to thousands of viewers who were both primed to believe him thanks to his marketing as the only person willing to speak the truth, and who might not have heard it otherwise. The families whose children were massacred have spent over a decade worried about their own safety because Alex Jones gave this narrative both credibility and reach. Not because Jones told his audience to do so, but because they believed those families were lying about having dead children in order to pass legislation that would threaten their constitutional rights. To them, harassing these people made a lot of sense. There is no reason for Jones to be ignorant of the fact that of thousands of people in the audience of Infowars who he has spent years stirring up the anger and distrust in, that there would not be those who would take their belief in that conspiracy and turn it into action against those Jones had blamed. That is stochastic terrorism. Libs of TikTok is a primarily Twitter-based social media profile run by a woman by the name of Chaya Rychek that has become a surprisingly large influence on right-wing politics. Despite TikTok being in the username, she has been permanently suspended from that platform as well as received multiple temporary suspensions from Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Though, since Elon Musk purchased Twitter, it's unlikely she will receive another suspension, as he, of course, does seem to be a fan of Rychik's work. Libs of TikTok has become popular on the political alt-right for directly naming organizations as well as individuals that are acting in ways deemed by right-wing figures to be an existential threat. This includes teaching certain topics, providing certain kinds of healthcare, and being certain kinds of people or even just supporting or being associated with those certain kinds of people. Most commonly, though certainly not solely, Reichick shares and reposts the social media posts of LGBTQI plus individuals and those who support them in even the most trivial ways, framing them in inflammatory posts that call them groomers, predators, pedophiles, indoctrinators, and other outrage-fueling terms. 
Taylor Lawrence of the Washington Post, who discovered Reichick's identity in 2022, writes, Just four months after getting started, Libs of TikTok got its big break. Joe Rogan started promoting the account to the millions of listeners of his hit podcast. By January, Reichick's page was leaning hard into groomer discourse, calling for any teacher who comes out as gay to their students to be fired on the spot. She called on her followers to contact schools that were allowing boys into the girls' bathrooms, and pushed the false conspiracy theory that schools were installing litter boxes in bathrooms for children who identify as cats. She also purported that adults who teach children about LGBTQ plus identities are abusive, that being gender nonconforming or an ally to the LGBTQ plus community is a mental illness, and referred to schools as government-run indoctrination camps for the LGBTQ plus community. DeSantis' press secretary Christina Pushaw credited the account with opening her eyes and informing her views on the state's restrictive legislation that bans discussion of sexuality or gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. She and Libs of TikTok have interacted with each other at least 138 times publicly, according to a report by Media Matters. When asked by the Post about her relationship with the account, Pushaw wrote, I follow, like, and retweet Libs of TikTok. My interactions with that account are public, and added that she's a strong supporter of its mission. Fox News hosts Jesse Waters and Tucker Carlson began featuring content straight from libs of TikTok on air, with Carlson urging his viewers to follow it before it's banned if you want to know what may be happening in your child's school. While libs of TikTok directly impacting legislation is concerning in and of itself, it becomes significantly more so when understanding how the account's target's lives changed after Reichick chose to aim her focus on them. As detailed by trans reporter Aaron Reed, Reichick has a long history of targeting a location, and that location then being the recipient of violent threats. Shortly after her tweets against Boston Children's Hospital, the hospital began receiving a series of bomb threats, partially shutting it down at times. In Keele, Wisconsin, after the account posted tweets targeting a school district there, multiple replies called for violence against the district. The district was then paralyzed for over a month by bomb threats. Similar examples could be seen in Pittsburgh Children's Hospital, Dornbecker Children's Hospital, Phoenix Children's Hospital, and more. All in all, the account has been linked to potentially inciting 66 separate threat events, most of which occurred within five days of her tweets as of December of 2022. This is stochastic terrorism. Another example of stochastic terrorism that showcases how it's become a political strategy is a pattern of deadly massacres starting in 2018 motivated by the Great Replacement Theory. The Great Replacement Theory, touted by right-wing pundits and politicians such as Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Tucker Carlson, and Matt Walsh, is an alt-right conspiracy that claims a shadowy cabal, which is often code for Jews, is trying to replace white people with various minorities, in particular immigrants and BIPOC. While the massacres we are about to discuss started in 2018, the Great Replacement Theory has its roots before that with one of its biggest entries into the mainstream seemingly coming by way of the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Khalid Rahman, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of Newsweek reported on the pattern in May 2022 after the mass shooting of 13 people at a Buffalo supermarket, 11 of them black and killing 10 of them. Rahman reports that there have been at least four different instances of massacres motivated by this specific conspiracy. Pittsburgh, Tree of Life, Synagogue Shooting. Robert Bowers, October 27th, 2018. Christchurch, New Zealand, Mosque Shootings. Brendan Tarrant, March 15th, 2019. El Paso, Texas, Walmart Shooting. Patrick Cruzis, August 3rd, 2019. Buffalo, New York, Shopping Mall Shooting. Peyton Gendron, May 14th, 2022. I don't particularly care if I got any of those names wrong, as they really don't deserve that amount of effort from me. The staff advice reported something similar in July 2022 that listed even more. Since Christchurch, there's been a string of shootings that have followed a similar blueprint of white supremacist terror, explicitly naming Tarrant as their inspiration. We're referring to the same racist conspiracy theories he cited. The fuse lit in Christchurch has resulted in bloodshed in Poway, California, El Paso, Texas, Barham, Norway, Halle, Germany, and most recently, Buffalo, unleashing terror in Jewish, Muslim, Latino, and Black communities. While from my research, stochastic terrorism does seem to, in America at least, be primarily associated with ideologies and beliefs held by influential right-wing political figures such as the ones mentioned above, it's important to recognize that stochastic terrorism is not a partisan issue. 
leftist political ideologies are not immune to potentially validating would-be terrorists looking for permission to follow their impulses. We must push back on all dehumanizing language and generalizations, because the more comfortable we get with dehumanizing our enemies, the more comfortable we get with violence or death. No matter where on the political spectrum we fall, we must all be aware of how our words can translate into violence within a divided and hostile culture such as the one we now live in. That's part of what's going to be so hard to accept with any solution we pursue. The laws and norms of society will never just affect the people we see as a threat. They will affect the people we want protected, including you, including me, including all our loved ones. Stay compassionate. Thank you so much to everyone who made it this far. This was a massive undertaking, as you might have gathered. I've been working on it for months. Hopefully we can release part two very soon. Then I'm definitely going to edit those together into a full version as it was originally intended for them to be. Part two will cover the gatekeepers of speech and monetary politics. Two terms I have coined that I'll explain in the next video. And because I never like to leave people hopeless, we will also be discussing where we should put our energy to address these extremely overwhelming issues. So please, 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 I know this was rough, but we do have hope. I just couldn't fit it in this specific video. Huge thanks to my friend and editor Bardock, couldn't do this without you, and I know this was a really difficult topic, so I really appreciate your dedication. Another special thanks to all the wonderful individuals who lent their voices to this video, all their names are on screen, and links to their channels and socials are in the description. Thanks to everyone in my incredible Discord community, Adam Plays a Host, who have all supported me as I wrote this and helped me fine-tune it. The link to that is in the description, along with my other socials and Bardock's, as well as my bibliography for this essay because it's always good to learn about and fact-check information for yourself. If you enjoyed or found this video useful, you can check out my other essays with links at the end of this video or the playlist in the comments. Or, if you have the financial capacity, you can join my Patreon at $1 or, if you want some rewards, $3 a month. At $3, you'll get shoutouts at the end of my videos, access to older works of mine no longer listed on my channel so you can see how far I've come, voting on polls and making suggestions for upcoming essays or nonviolent games I should play on Twitch, and access to the Queers and Deers role in my Discord community, which allows you to engage with and even potentially contribute to all my current works in progress, including my video essays, my Twitch streams, and my work at the DC Creators Network. With luck, I'm hoping to put out one video essay like this a month, so if you want to see the next one, make sure to subscribe to catch it when it comes out. Other than that, leave a like if you liked the video, dislike it if you didn't, give your civil thoughts in the comments, give me feedback, or hell, just comment some gibberish for the algorithm. And I'll see you all soon.